Well, you know, look, we're all space advocates here. Gary Fisher and I, we're like really old space advocates. We've turned gray together in the space advocacy business. Gary's going to address for you judges all your questions about the business plan to enter this here in a minute. But I'm here to speak to you as fellow space advocates. I'm going to try to do that with no BS. As space advocates, we all know that there are some real total showstoppers just beyond LEO, just outside the protective cocoon of the Van Allen belts. We know this. Every one of us, if we were honest, could name a dozen. For instance, we don't have any idea whether we can generate enough artificial gravity to significantly impede loss of bone mass. We've never tried it, even with mice stuck in a centrifuge and micro-G. We've never thrown a CubeSat out of the hatch, tethered to a counterweight, spun it around to see if we can simulate Earth normal in the center of a spacecraft. We've never simulated a radiation survival crew capsule outside LEO to determine if we can keep a crew alive during a solar flare. And we've never kept a spacecraft clean, livable, and hygienic after sticking a bunch of naturally dirty humans inside of it. Exocote is going to try and tackle some of these outstanding issues. And we're going to do it in a way that reaps profits in the 1G and benefits in 1G. How? Well, it sounds simple, but we are proposing a new coat of paint. That's it. And that it will be a significant part of the solution to issues that may impede or actually block human spaceflight outside of LEO. Now, I want to make a very heavy emphasis on the word new. Because you see, paints and coatings traditionally have only protected the underlying surfaces on which they rest, and in some cases they've decorated it. But the coatings that we are talking about will dynamically alter the environment in which they are found. To grasp this, you need to first understand two things. One, how ubiquitous aerospace coatings are in a spacecraft. And two, how much surface area is really there in those coatings that interact with the environment. Every object made by the hand of man is coated as a separate step in its manufacturing process. That holds true for aircraft and spacecraft too. This is to say nothing of the coated surfaces on hidden equipment like conduit and wiring that remain out of sight but intimately connected to the spacecraft environment. Nor does it take into consideration the coatings on the outside of spacecraft, such as solar panels, seals, and viewports. On top of the ubiquity of the coating, you need to appreciate that the length and the width of a coated surface is an inadequate measure of how much area there is in a coating that is actually in contact with the environment. In fact, you must take into consideration the depth of the coating. You must as well look at the porosity in the coating in order to calculate the actual surface area. When you do this, what you find is that the actual surface area is immense. What we are doing is trying to turn this immense surface area from a liability into an asset. We are turning the coating from an inert state to a very large dynamic instrument. After almost 10 years and $10 million of investment monies, a lot of it mine, Certain of these engineering systems are commercially available at Reactive Surfaces, the parent company. And Exocode, the company I'm talking about to you today, is being given the job of bringing them into the aerospace market. They presently include coatings for military aircraft that rapidly detoxify surfaces from chemical and biological weapons. They include completely non-toxic proteins that are very efficient biocides, comparable, are, are capable of keeping surfaces microbe-free. They include self-cleaning surfaces that eliminate natural greases, fats, and oils from surfaces that accumulate there. So where does one get these sorts of additives that you stick in these coatings? Well, the answer is nature. Nature has been at the business and at the, mole the molecules that populate surfaces and natural surfaces um, have evolved over millennia. And they efficiently rid themselves of microbes. They degrease themselves and they eliminate toxin from their surfaces. We have just built the world's first functional coatings manufacturing plant 
in Mississippi alongside the world's premier polymer institute. We have protected these technologies with an extensive worldwide intellectual property portfolio numbering in the several dozens of issued patents and in hundreds of presently prosecuting patent applications. We're adding them at a rate of about a dozen per year now and that rate is increasing. This approach has already garnered us several awards and nominations. In 2008, we were unanimously selected for the, give, the American Coatings Award uh, for these coatings, beating out industry leaders such as BASF and um, Roman Haas. Last year, we were nominated by the Sherwin-Williams Company, uh, the only other company I know that's delivered paint from space onto Earth. Um, we were nominated by the Sherwin-Williams Company to receive the PDMA's Product Innovation Award in company with former winners Apple, 3M, and Dow. So, as you all, judges, deliberate over the next few hours, we have created a small kit. This kit right here, you're going to get it. Uh, continuing on uh, one of those such bio-based functionality coatings, and we'll be able to do it yourself. Thank so, you. All right, thanks. Yeah, if our six minutes is up, thank I you. I understand. And my colleague, Gary Fisher, is going to come up here and help me answer the business que questions. Hello. Um, one of the things I remember when, before Mir was deorbited, were news reports about how contaminated it was. So, and that there was mold everywhere and it, there were major problems associated with it. So, do you know what those molds were and have you tested your coatings against them? Yes, the answer to that is, is yes. Um, the molds, many cases, were something called black mold, stachyboitrus. Uh, that's something, one of the ones that you don't, don't want, want in your to. house. No. <laughs> okay. Uh, in addition to that, algae um, and a lot of bacillus uh, spores. Uh, there were, we were, I was just recently at a conference in NASA where we were looking at those kinds of issues, and in fact, they are on ISS as well, under the towel racks and the bathing facilities and the uh, workout facilities, anywhere you have moisture in, 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 advan uh, in more than just ambient moisture, you see a lot of that. And that's an increasing problem. Um, there, are, um, um, there are issues uh, also with things uh, that are, are typically not seen as biocidal, and these are viruses. Viruses are very difficult to kill. These coatings actually tackle some of the uh, nastiest of the viruses. These are the ones that are, environment that are encapsulated. They actually eliminate the, or they prevent the, the virus from being able to um, infect. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, did, you, uh, did you hear the story on, the, on Amir about the candles? It really smelled bad, <laughs> terribly bad. Um, so <clears throat> is there any opportunity for you to fly some of your equipment to see what the difference is compared to what's up there now? Yes, we've been offered that opportunity. Um, and uh, we are working with a company right now uh, to look at that. This is a, this is a pay-as-you-go kind of a situation, and so we have to decide whether we're going to make that kind of an investment um, and fly these, fly these coatings, mainly panels. Uh, first of all, very interesting technology and product. Um, Sorry, I didn't finish it. Sorry, I didn't get to the end of it. It is. Okay. Um, my question was more sort of how, how your market breaks down. It seems like you have lots of aerospace applications, terrestrial applications. Um, certainly the space application is of interest to the group here. Uh, but there's only so many capsules and space stations. And, and uh, so is it you know, maybe an early market, but very small compared to your future? Or well, uh, how does space fit into yes, the whole we, business? Yes, well, we're sort of looking at the aerospace market, and the purpose of Exocode is to market to the aerospace market in its entirety. Um, and we, we pick that market because it is um, a great place to start because of the cachet associated with particularly space applications. Um, the interiors of aircraft are like little microcosms. You have kitchens, you have bathrooms, you have furnishings. In some aircraft, you have laboratories and sleeping places. So um, if we can get our products into those environments, it makes it much easier to go uh, to the other markets, the terrestrial markets, and say, you know, you, you, we're degreasing kitchens on aircraft and, you know, we're sanitizing spacecraft. Um, you know, it'd be easier to get in, we feel. Um, our degrease product, for example, would be great in commercial kitchens, 
but we could penetrate that market a lot and it just doesn't have any relevance to anyone else. You know, but, but aircraft are, you know, you can point to all sorts of things going on in aircraft and we can implement our products in carpets, paneling, textiles, so. Yeah, following on that, uh, that, that all made sense to me and that's how it came across to me in the write-up, especially the aircraft market because it's just booming and uh, you also mentioned at the very front end of your write-up that you're a well-financed R&D company already, which you just said. So my question is, why aren't you starting already? And why do you need this particular uh, competition to help kickstart that for you? That's a great question, and in one of the answers is lesson learned. And the lesson learned was what I heard someone else talking about earlier. We originally went in strictly into the military military coding and trying to to get that military sell cycle windled down or you know diminished to to the point that we could actually do it. We are just now getting to that point after you know eight years of trying to do so. So the first answer to the question is we learned a hard lesson, okay, and that's the military sell cycle. The second answer to part of the, the question is that uh, we are. Uh, last year we sold over uh, we put $420,000 to the U.S. military um, of one of our additives. This is the detoxifying additive. Um, and we, are, we have serious interest from coming right now. So yes, we are. But Gary and I are space advocates. I said that right at the first. And we want to be in this game. I have a hard sell with some of my investors about that. So that's why, frankly. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd like to know a little bit more um, specifically about kind of how this problem is currently being addressed today. We have a lot of people that have been up in the space station. Obviously, also, that has a quantified cost associated with it. And I'm interested in the cost delta, particularly for an organization like NASA that's having cutbacks, mm -hmm. and they seem to be that first and maybe only customer for a little bit. I mean, I don't know if you've talked to SpaceX about the Dragon, but obviously having humans yeah. and any of these sorts of things, clearly there's the issue, but it has to be being mitigated today at some cost level, and I'm, I'm interested in the cost difference between your solution and what's being currently done today as a value proposition, and I'm also interested in who your first, who you think your first near-term market is really gonna be, and particularly the customer. Right. And are you talking about in the in the space space markets? Well, whatever your first near term market well, is, you put the U.S. military is already one of our clients, so that we 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 intend to right, but the, leverage that. So you're going to go after the whole military, or just the Navy and their ships, or well, the, that's the got US, some the capital US, associated with I'm it. It's going to be a, um, an issue. The U.S. Army is the first and foremost. Okay, surprisingly. The, the, the FBI right. is not doing it. Uh, there are a lot of scenarios right now in which chemical weapons are, they loom large. Right. You all know about them. They're bragging about it. But I guess I, maybe what I'm trying to get at, what do you think the total amount of capital is going to be that you're going to need to get, get to break even? Because it's not clear to me on exactly who the first customers are and what the, what the early customer opportunities and costs um, are going to be. Well, I, you know, we're, we're looking to develop this Exoco marketing organization. And, and that's what this funding requirement is, mm -hmm. to do that. Um, that, the, the, the potential demand here is so vast, and basically you would want to coat every piece of military equipment to protect it against biological and chemical warfare. Um, you know, currently we have some interest from the Air Force um, to look at open pit, open uh, cockpit vehicles like helicopters. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, if that, if that takes off, um, it, it would open the door to lots of opportunity, but um, we have a paint coatings factory. It can produce a certain quantity of output. I think at some point we would need to license the technology to others in order to satisfy demand. Mm -hmm. um, and so we don't see ourselves as being a Sherwin-Williams kind of coatings company, a vast uh, factory, uh, factories generating you know, millions of gallons of paint. Um, it's more uh, our coatings plan is to develop customized uh, things and for people to try out, and if volume increases sufficiently, we go find some other manufacturer. So we're looking for strategic partners all along here who would perhaps make most of the investment to satisfy the customer demand. Yeah, and we've just we've just entered two in, uh, strategic relationships, one with Nagasi uh, out of Japan, and the other with uh, advanced polymer coatings for anti-fouling coatings. So we are looking at the strategic partnering route as well.